Okay. All right. As you bring it up, I could say a couple of things. And yeah, please do. Yeah, well, uh, what we're going to see will be some of the most uh, recent work that I've done. And I'll talk a little bit about the process. And I would, <laughs> I would also uh, have this as an opportunity to kind of transition into what will be a, a short series of images over time, largely uh, images composed up in the Salish Sea uh, country, of which Anacortes, uh, and Tadago Island uh, is principal, uh, and of course the San Juan Islands. When I looked at the title of Give a Hoot, I thought of one of the immediate uh, pieces that we'd take a look at, one that I finished up uh, the end of 2019 and had in a show here in town uh, for about two days and this show was over <laughs> because as we know the pandemic required the closure and it's certainly understandable but in any event I had a, a good deal of uh, delight in carving out of slate images uh, that are not unlike images you could uh, render in the pen and ink work that I've done a lot of my books uh, illustration in. This is, of course, in, at the edge of the woods is a title, and it's a great horned owl, a bird that's not unfamiliar to all of us uh, in the woods of the Northwest, although the barred owl has come in uh, in good numbers. But again, uh, a good one to start with for give a hoot, because the owls are a principal measure of the vitality of a forest and the type of dynamics that exist within. Now, I'm carving this in slate that I salvaged from a pool table. And I think a lot of artists will tell you, hey, if I can do art uh, with a piece of string, uh, I'll do it. And the pool table is composed, especially the older ones, of this wonderful carvable slate. And I'm going to hold up a slab of slate that I've cut and I'm working on. It's of a poor will, a relative of the nighthawk. And you can see that it's not very thick, but it's a very solid carvable piece of stone. And then I can highlight parts of it by incising in and getting the lighter shades of the stone to come forward and the darker shades of the stone uh, are polished. So that gives it the, the sculptural form, even though this is a flat piece. It's framed like a picture. Uh, and in fact, uh, it hangs like a picture, a little heavier, however. In the next slide, uh, we'll see another one of these. This one is called Forest Icon, and I asked Asa to pick out uh, some of these recent carvings of mine that would relate directly to the forest. And the goshawk is a bird that we do have in the forests of the Cascades. Occasionally, they do get into the San Juan Islands, but they are a bird of, of the deep, deep forest. I will make a preliminary drawing, and over here to the side, I'm going to try to hold up and give you an idea of the kind of drawing that I would do to give me a sense of what I might try to bring out in the slate. But I wanted to capture that intensity that these birds have. You see a goshawk, you don't forget it. Uh, they are about as wild a bird as we have, and they possess that throughout their survival, throughout their lives. And that, to me, is one of the remarkable things about them. This, this vitality that they have and this glare that this particular bird has set me with when I saw it in the forest here in the Cascades. Another, another image also carved that Asa will put up is probably very familiar to all of us, Pileated Woodpecker, uh, the great wood hewer. That's the title of this slate carving. And again, you can see the patterns of color uh, the dark, the light, the red, I can texture that using a stylus in the stone to bring out those patterns and then polish the rest of it, including the wood that the woodpecker is so uh, adroitly, I guess is the word, attached to with those special tail feathers, those incredible toes that hook into the bark, and then of course that 
a fundamental bill of the woodpecker that I wanted to give emphasis to as well. These are, these are really uh, cornerstone, uh, keystone species, I think is the better term. Because if you've got woodpeckers in your forest, that means you have all kinds of other species in the forest as well. Uh, a lot of owls that will exclusively use cavities, particularly the pileated woodpecker, flying squirrels, honeybees for that matter. Uh, an incredible bird, crow size. And the final one that I wanted to show you of this series is entitled Standoff. And we wander through the forest, which to me is an endless array of surprises. And sometimes we don't have to go very far if we just are attentive, and I know that the members of Friends of the Forest are probably doubly so, to realize that something is going on out there. And I was wandering through the woods near our house here in Lake Forest Park, and a hummingbird had been uh, creating a fuss and then landed, and I wondered what it might have uh, been attracted to. And I saw the little hummingbird. It uh, <clears throat> was an anise, and it was perched above a sharp shinned hawk. And it remained there, safely distanced above and out of reach of the hawk to keep an eye on it. But it, to me, it represented this incredible composition of in the woods, uh, a predatory, beautiful little predatory bird, the sharp shin, and then this bold, dynamic little hummingbird perched above to keep an eye on it. It's very survival dependent upon that hummingbird, knowing where that hawk was all the time, if it could. Eventually, I just the left, left the two of them to uh, sorted out between them, but I never forgot that particular moment of and dynamic between these two beautiful forms that we find in the woods. From this point, we're going to go on into a whole series and we can just simply move through and I will, uh, I think at some pace, talk about the greater Puget Sound uh, northern portion Salish Sea area and the woods there and how that has inspired so much of my work. One of the things that I was able to do, I think I brought up uh, this habit of wanting to get into the water while I was a kid in Southern California. I got up here at 17. Uh, I hadn't ever really thought too much about exploring the, uh, the underwater world as much as I did the terrestrial world. But once I got out into the, into the sea, uh, this is long before uh, the uh, scuba diving and, and uh, spearfishing uh, activity really took hold up here in Puget Sound. There was a far greater abundance of, of uh, various kinds of fish and crustaceans and such at that time. But I do remember the gradations of, of energy and activity from the eagle above, the foraging grebe, and then down in those incredible uh, fields of productivity, the eelgrass beds full of fish and a variety of life that, that gives whole, the whole uh, sustenance and weaves in that strength of, of life in, in the sound that we live in. Okay. Prowling around uh, in some of the mouths of the rivers where they flow into, uh, into the sea, uh, you find the, the flatfish. Uh, this happens to be a halibut interpretation. You're not gonna see a lot of halibut, halibut. You do see other flatfish in, in those areas, but I was always captivated by this flat form that would settle into the substrate. And while I'm going along through the water, just eyeballing this great reel of, of life and activity and design, sometimes I would startle one of these and they'd bolt out in this great of flood and cloud of sand and then only disappear in, into the mist beyond. But uh, this is a piece of marble, brown marble that I've incised uh, and then polished, giving emphasis to that wonderful form that allows this species to survive. Of course, this is not an unfamiliar bird to us uh, in that Anacortes area, particularly uh, when you go to catch the ferry and we see the pelagic cormorants that are breeding there alongside uh, the terminal. But we have 
the Brands cormorant, the double-crested cormorant as well. And cormorants have, have come back uh, and rebounded, if you will, significantly. Uh, a beautiful bird. They're a very efficient fishing bird. Uh, and while we explore the forest and see what survives and what dominates, I think this is one of the birds uh, that has dominated uh, a lot of our marine systems because of its efficiency. Gulamats uh, are also, to me, uh, an attractive uh, subject. This is a, a black uh, serpentinite, a uh, chlorite, excuse me, uh, out of the North Cascades, actually. And during their courtship rituals, and we see them uh, on some of the substrates along the island edges, uh, these, uh, of course, with their white uh, apolettes, if you will, uh, during the breeding season, and then changing plumage during the winter to a more fully white body, if you will. But in any event, uh, this is one of the members of the family uh, of alcids that will dive and use their wings uh, like other species of diving birds will use their webbed feet. They have webbed feet, but their wings will propel them. But I was particularly struck by the way in which the Gumats would uh, assemble on the rocks and go through these wonderful courtship activities, uh, bumping chests, touching beaks, exchanging food uh, in that beautiful uh, slender svelte form that they have. Again, carved, I wanted to get that negative space in there to emphasize the beak and the shape of the head, separate the body below, uh, cutting through, and then giving definition to the wings uh, in those incredible channels uh, of feathers that come down and support the bird's form. Trumpeter swans have made a remarkable comeback as well. And you see them just over the hills from Anacortes down into the valleys uh, of the Skagit, along with uh, the tundra swans that are equally uh, abundant. This is a piece of a statuary or marble. Uh, it weighed, when I got it, about 2,500 pounds. And I had it for a number of years. And I like to tell the story. I was never really sure <laughs> what I would do uh, with this 2,500 pound chunk of marble that I had over in my studio until somebody said, I'll give you a, a good chunk of change if you would carve a pair of swans for me. And boy, like that, I could immediately see the swans take shape. Now, this has been in front of the, uh, gosh, the uh, Lee Aki Woodson Art Museum for almost 30 years now. Uh, and they take great care of it. Uh, it uh, flew back from, from uh, Seattle uh, back into Wisconsin uh, and made it safely. I want to show you very quickly what part of the process involved. When I first started, uh, uh, manager friend, uh, uh, artist friend, Fen Lansdowne had a manager by the name of Bud Feely. And Bud was a great collector of uh, Eskimo uh, Native American art. And he said that the carvers in the Northern Territories would use an ax or a hatchet to carve and of course they had to sharpen them frequently, but that's the way they fashioned a lot of their forms. So when I first started, uh, I started with a hatchet. And uh, I think some of the first things I did, uh, because I didn't finish them very well, looked like I hatched them. Uh, the piece of marble here, 300 pound piece, also of Scotchuario, this is Italian white marble. Uh, I could see, and if you looked at that long enough, I would bet that many of you would also see it form from nature. I saw a bird with a wing up, uh, and I drew on the stone after I did a series of drawings on paper, transferred the drawing to the stone, and then I used tools other than a hatchet now that have come on to the market when I started with diamond saws, for instance, that will cut down into the stone much quicker than a hatchet ever would. And that's the way I proceeded. There's the drawing transferred to the stone, it's reversed. 
and you can see the outline of the falcon. Now my job is to cut down back into and around and then remove the stone that isn't necessary. And this is the way the process looks. You still use the hammer and chisel. You cut in, you break off, you cut in, you break off, and then you grind and you rasp and you sand. So that part of it hasn't changed, but the diamond technology has really advanced carving the hard stone like nothing before. And one more would show you the finished piece. This is a Jure falcon, also one of the birds that comes into the part of the country that uh, we all live in, where you are living, uh, particularly along the floodplains uh, during the Arctic uh, winters, they will come down to the south migratory birds that they are. The kingfisher, uh, not necessarily a bird of the forest, but certainly a bird near the forest and along the shores. This is a piece of gray marble. And again, I think the challenge of the sculptor, uh, particularly in stone, is to understand the strength of, not only the strength, but also the potential. And immediately seeing this beautiful gray stone, I started to think of the kingfisher. But I also had to realize that a stone, unlike metal, has its limits. So in order to protect that beak, I thought about having that kingfisher just catch that fish and attach the tip of the beak uh, to the dorsal fin of the fish and the fish's uh, frontal portion touching the kingfisher. So I had this three point connection to the, to the sculpture itself and gave it the strength that I thought would be appropriate. Also, of course, I had a stone that was hard enough that would allow me to show that wonderful crest that the kingfisher has. Posing it, trying to capture its attitude, giving it some of the authenticity of how it lives, but also understanding what the potential of the stone would be to carry it out. Well, we've got otters both in the forest and out of the forest. They've been a fairly successful uh, species here in the sound. Uh, we see them, they're miraculous in their uh, speltness, uh, the way in which they move through the water. I've seen them diving. Uh, I've watched them from the shore. I've seen them in the forest uh, up on Lopez Island, uh, coming out of the forest after foraging from one place to another. Probably somebody's goldfish pond <laughs> going on to the next farm. <clears throat> but in any event, this is a serpent night from the North Cascades. Uh, something that uh, years ago I would go on what I'd call rock foraging <clears throat> and find uh, riverbeds and old uh, outcrops that I could wedge stone out of, load up a truck, bring it home, and provide myself with enough stone for a couple of years. When you polish this, that's another thing. It's one thing to rough it out, but the polishing brings out the whole uh, warmth and the vitality and the depth of the stone itself and especially matching a brown stone with with the colors of how I would imagine and I've seen otter uh, in sunlight was something that I sought to do. <clears throat> Mink also uh, in and out of the forest. Uh, this is a flat piece of black chloride. Uh, short story about this was I showed this piece uh, in picture some years ago, and the uh, reaction of, of one of the people uh, in the audience was, hey, that's okay, sculpture, but what the hell is that mink eating that trout for? That's mine. Well, <clears throat> it struck me as being kind of funny at the time, but I think that's one of the things that art can convey uh, in its own subtle way, because an artist brings their values to what they do, and they're not only sharing the form, but they're sharing their respect and the values they have for the subject that they're portraying. And Mink had every right to that trout. You know, they've been eating them for <clears throat> 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 years. And the uh, people of uh, the earth have likewise been sharing in the fish as we should and as we do. But the idea that we, we 
we share these resources was something that was uh, immediately, that I was conveying was immediately brought forward with that comment. That's all one piece of stone, like this one is, uh, basking hawk. Uh, I used to fly hawks, uh, both in California and up here in Washington. And this is a Cooper's hawk who was uh, very fond of taking baths and sunbathing. And I've watched wild birds do likewise, where once they bathe, uh, they'll stretch out in the sun again, not like a, not unlike a person might, who's comfortable and relaxed, enjoying you know the the warmth, uh, the light of nature, and yet to me it represented an opportunity to provide a interesting design where this stretched bird with all of the lines of the feathers, primary, secondary, tail, and the elevated head looking up uh, above. Again, as one piece of stone, the polished is black, the unpolished is white, to give it the sense of the bird being separate from the substrate. Likewise, with this uh, piece of alabaster, uh, a young spotted owl. Uh, we have barred owls in our forest uh, on the west, perhaps a few in the Olympics. I gather the last of the barred owls in British Columbia are struggling to, to, stay, uh, to stay in place for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which, of course, is the disappearing of their habitat, the disappearance of their habitat that we're consuming. Uh, and these are one of the things that we have to understand is the allocation of forests for all life. And certainly we depend upon it and we, we require it for any number of reasons, but we also depend upon and require the life within it. And this young owl, uh, again, in the polished gray color, uh, certainly matched, in my mind, the proper uh, color of the young owl, uh, looking forward to launching into the forest off of his perch. Another owl, uh, again, uh, very familiar to us up in Skagit and Whatcom County along the shorelines, the short-eared owl, particularly in the winter where they come along with the northern harriers. Uh, this is a, a piece of uh, limestone, uh, one of my favorite owls, <coughs> the, uh, the short-eared owl. Uh, they are, as we know, diurnal, uh, to some degree nocturnal, but particularly out flying uh, along the range of uh, the dikes and along the shorelines uh, in their hunting, uh, matching perfectly the background of, of the marshes that they patrol. Like the spotted owl, uh, I think uh, a very iconic and uh, powerful presence in its own way is, is the marble murelet. This is a piece entitled Bird at Sea, and I should give you some sense of the scale. Um, most of the pieces we've looked at are usually a foot and a half, two feet uh, uh, high or in, in breadth. This one is probably 14 inches by 10 inches, and it's a bird the size uh, of the marble murelet of, of a small pigeon that is one that requires the old growth forest. Amazing bird. We're still discovering uh, its persistence in survival. Uh, flying back up the rivers 12, 14 miles sometimes to find a proper place in an old growth forest to breed. Uh, they will lay their eggs on a big broad branch among the mosses, perhaps raise only one a youngster a year. When the youngster fledges, uh, it will take its first flight uh, or a flight and then a walk to the local river and float out to the estuaries and then spend a good portion of its next few years at sea before it too returns to the old forest to breed. But look at the wing, which was something I wanted to emphasize. Cut under the wing, give the emphasis to this paddle. This is another one of those diving birds that uses its wing much you know, like the other diving birds would use their feet to propel them through the water. One piece, uh, this is black chlorite, 
uh, and I tried to texture it uh, with rasps and then sanded it down and waxed it to give the sense of pushing along uh, out in through the water. And then when you polish the chloride itself with a very fine uh, grit, uh, polishing uh, sand, sandpaper is what you could call it, it's wet and dry. That's when the color emerges and when you wax it, it intensifies the color. Also, uh, diving birds. Uh, <clears throat> this, this provides you a pretty good range of, of what I've done over the years. This, these are a few of, of a lot of pieces that I've done, but this is a, <clears throat> a, a piece of marble. And I was out uh, on a, a dock in Edmonds uh, on a fall day with the sun out. And uh, I saw a loon chasing another loon, <clears throat> diving out on the far edge of the fishing dock, caught the two of them, caught in, in the light coming down through the water. And again, like the experience uh, of watching that goshawk in the forest, uh, or any number of these pieces, standoff with the hawk and the hummingbird. These are things that you remember. And then as the artist, you retrieve them at a time when you can match your idea, your concept, and maybe even your confidence with the material that you're working in. They all come together, they converge. Uh, again, one piece of marble, it's approximately three feet <clears throat> in length, uh, a foot and a half high, showing these diving loons that I had watched pass under me at the dock. The polishing brings out that color, almost like a Jackson Pollock stippling of paint across the back of the black bird. But that's the way the light looked. And it was, again, a great delight. They call it serendipitous, something I hadn't totally anticipated. But I could see the, just the elements of, of color in the rock, but it really came forward when I polished it. <clears throat> Throughout uh, my career, I've had the good fortune to turn from one thing to another. Uh, Writing and illustrating uh, has, has kept me attuned to the subject uh, that I have studied, but also the drawing has kept me involved in interpreting the variety of postures and attitudes. The guillemots, again, uh, in this drawing, done, the concept anyway, off uh, Lopez Island, uh, and watching those guillemots before the breeding season gather in the one on the left of the picture presenting uh, to likely a, a female, a, a small fish that it's caught. Uh, so I, I, I would say I've had the good fortune uh, and also I suppose the motivation and inclination to do a number of things. And that seems to, that combination, one thing has fed another and, and that's the way I work. And not by any stretch of the imagination would I expect that uh, someone else would necessarily work the same way, nor should they. But I think as, as people who uh, find art as part of their life, it's a matter of finding a, a, a medium that you're comfortable with, or maybe more than one, and exploring what it is that you can say in your art that maybe words would otherwise not say. Or you can get deeper into it than ever before. And certainly one of the reasons I've been an artist is to understand things and to have a sense of tangibility uh, and purpose. And that's, I hope, will continue the rest of my life. Shorebirds, not much to be said. We've seen them huddled up in the winter. Forward into the wind, wind sweeping over. Ravens, constant subject uh, of mine, and probably will be through throughout my days because uh, having had a number of ra ravens at my at my homes uh, early on. Uh, not by the way taken from nests. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> then would get a raven and not really know what to do with them. Uh, and came to me and I 
I would say I had the good fortune to have a couple of them for a few years. But uh, ravens can be very demanding and uh, mischievous. And I've written and been part of writing three uh, different books on ravens, crows, magpies, and jays. And it's just a never ending source of discovery about them. This is in front of the uh, Redmond Library. It's entitled Wisdom Seekers. And of course, uh, the native people, uh, the first American uh, people have revered the ravens, particularly here in the Northwest. And I think their myths, their stories, their beliefs have certainly instructed and inspired me. And all you need to do is be reminded of that uh, inspiration every time you look at some of their carvings and paintings. <clears throat> and for that matter, all sorts of arts that they practice, ravens often being a principal part of it. This is another, another big pool table. Uh, I think this slab weighed about 150 pounds. Uh, it's in a museum in, in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, uh, called Raven's Wall. <clears throat> Very much a uh, loquacious uh, social bird, and you've all heard them in the forest. Uh, I had to promise myself to do a raven call, because if I just keep talking, uh, I have this tendency to fall asleep on myself. So uh, doing a call once in a while, including a great horned owl, which I was going to do at the beginning, but I have no more owls coming up, so I'll do it now. <laughs> I've got an audience over here laughing, but um, for good reason. Anyway, in the next slide, Some of you may may recognize this um, from the Mount Baker area, uh, and they are indeed calling. But they have all kinds of calls. This is a called the emissaries, and the emissaries was based on an experience that I had in Alaska quite a while ago up on the Copper River Delta, and this was sponsored by the Artists for Nature group. And these were artists from all over the world. Uh, there were, well, there were only 12 of us when we were up there for a couple of weeks. And we're out on the, uh, we're out on the uh, Copper River Delta. And that is this vast, vast, it seems like an endless plain of, uh, of estuary and, and delta going right up to the face of the glaciers where the Copper River uh, flows from, uh, up into the mountains, from the mountains. And while we're standing there, there was one old snag, and we're, we'd gotten out and walked out. Uh, we could hear ravens way off in the distance calling. And one of the, this also gives me a chance to, to uh, and by the way, my <clears throat> Spanish and Scottish friends don't mind me doing this, okay? It may not be politically correct, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the Scotsman, a guy named Keith Brucky, Brucky's, uh, Says, hey, I, th I hear ravens. Yeah, hey, there they are. And Keith's got a hell of a high. And, he, and there they are. These two ravens are flying in our direction, talking to one another. <laughs> Getting closer and closer. Hey, uh, I wonder where they're going to go. Good Lord, they got a land right here. They never do that in Scotland. And they landed right in the tree above our heads, uh, maybe 60 feet away, the two of them. And we're all just glassy-eyed and jaw-dropped, looked at them. And, <laughs> and, and Juan says, oh, I wonder, I wonder maybe they are welcoming us. And I believe they were. They had come in, sized us up, took a look at us. We didn't have any guns. We didn't look hostile. We all had sketch pads. They turned around and flew back up into the places, into the recesses of the forest beyond and disappeared and continued to call all the way. Of course, <clears throat> the story then that we then told, the ravens met us, they saw us, they sized us up, and they said we were okay. And that was the first or second day that we were there, and we had this great adventure for the next two weeks. Emissaries of the forest, the ravens, they welcome us. If, <clears throat> if, 
we in welcoming them as well. <clears throat> Emissaries again with daughter Bryony uh, on the right. And folks, that is the conclusion of the series of images that I wanted to share with you. And I would love to have any questions <clears throat> if anybody is still there and awake. And if not, then uh, I probably can <clears throat> do a few more bird calls and uh, we can wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. We, we definitely appreciate the bird calls, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, I, I, I'll start picking those off, but I was also wondering, um, you know, you had mentioned when we talked earlier about some of uh, the art activities in, that you've experienced in Anacortes and artists, especially uh, Peregrine. Yeah, yeah, very good. You know, uh, I would really encourage, uh, well, not only anyone in the area, but anywhere around uh, the Northwest when they visit uh, the Anacortes area and move on up <clears throat> towards Padilla Bay, Bow and Edison, uh, there are wonderful galleries and amazing artists uh, on Whitby Island. Uh, I, I think of uh, Anacortes friend Peregrine O'Gormley, uh, Leo Osborne uh, up on the island, Guamus. Uh, I think of the Smith Valley uh, gallery uh, there in Bow Edison having some terrific uh, paintings and interpretations, uh, and again, uh, historically. And then the Museum of Northwest Art, having uh, an exceptional collection of art that again, uh, is historical and contemporary in having artists, each as an individual, come forward sharing what is important and, and feeling uh, deeply uh, about uh, the area that we so cherish. <clears throat> the barn show, I think, is currently on at the Museum of Northwest Art. And they have done a, uh, a remarkable job of bringing together a, a long history going uh, all the way, well, all the way back to some of the historical artists of the valley and, and Anacortes. And this is a, uh, to me, a, uh, a terrific opportunity to take a peek at uh, a broad range of artists who are represented there. I'm, I know I'm, there's some artist friends that <clears throat> uh, I'll think of uh, that I ought to mention as well who are doing such wonderful work. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Asa, I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, that's great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So we've got a question uh, about stone and what draws you to stone as a medium? <clears throat> I think it's permanence for, for uh, for starters, uh, I think it's resistance. Uh, it's funny how uh, you, you get into the rhythm of working the stone and initially it, it doesn't necessarily want to work with you. Uh, and you begin to apply yourself and you see some changes and psychologically it's rewarding. Physically, it's rewarding because you, you feel You've expended this energy, you can see these changes. <clears throat> and when you finish a piece, uh, the stone has this revelation at the end where all these beautiful patterns and colors really start to come in to their own and intensify. Uh, that reward at the end has also attracted me to it. Bronze, uh, not so much. It's permanent, as permanent can be. Uh, but you have to typically apply colors to it. You can do some wonderful things. Uh, but in any event, the, uh, the stone still you know, holds that special part uh, in my uh, artistic heart. And I think, again, the permanence of it uh, has been something because it's, uh, I can go back to it. It hasn't changed. It, it can eventually, of course, and if it's outside some stone, is subject to uh, some, you know, dangerous uh, impacts by uh, whatever's in the air or in the water. But I think that answers in part, you know, what it is uh, that attracts me. 
Sometimes, by the way, Asa, just the shape of the stone will suggest something. I'll see it uh, like the shape uh, of the uh, swans that I mentioned. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they to the till I had a motivation, I, I wasn't looking very deeply. The shape of the falcon's wing, that very quickly was suggested to my to my imagination. Uh, so those are a summary of some of the things that attracts me. And, and kind of a follow up to that, and, and I have a feeling it's it's kind of a mixture, but you know, is it more often that the idea comes and then you pick the medium or is it the medium and you're, you're looking at it and an idea forms or how does that work for you? Well, <clears throat> almost, it could almost be 50, 50. Uh, it, I, I think that the best things that I've done, uh, I've gone with the rock. I've gone with the stone. The, the stone has suggested to me what it like to, it would like to do. And, and I'm working with it rather than against it. I'm not imposing so much. Uh, but sometimes if I'm going to do like the kingfisher that I showed you that was gray in that uh, bordillo, it's a, also a beautiful gray stone. Well, because it was gray, uh, and I've done some northern shrikes likewise in gray stone by the color, not the shape. And then I spent a lot of time on that kingfisher defining the shape and, and, and making it more of, of, of what the, the kingfisher concept and feeling would be. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, another stone question, where, uh, where do you source your rocks from? Sorry, where do I, what? Where do you source your rocks from? <laughs> Legally? <laughs> 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 now, well, you know, you, you don't just walk out on federal land and load up a, uh, with your front loader uh, back of a semi with stone. Uh, you know, it, it, you need a, a permit to do that. Uh, but I have picked up rock out of riverbeds. Uh, I, I picked up off the ground up in the North Cascades where there was a lot of serpentinite right out there easily picked up. I didn't feel like I was pulling the side of a mountain off. But uh, you can, and I, ha I have, purchased directly from Italy. And we called up uh, another, uh, another story here, quickly. Um, a guy who, uh, a guy named Rich Grotofen, used to be in the stone business. And, and uh, Rich, uh, and I schemed to call Italy direct. And uh, neither one of us could speak Italian, but I said, I think I can fake it. <laughs> well, let me know. You, you know, that's the other thing. If you're gonna carve stone, you, you're not real hesitant about taking off on something. You go ahead and do it, sometimes by the seat of your pants and see what happens. So we called up uh, Italy where we knew there was a broker and uh, the guy answers, Whatever you're saying, yeah. And, uh, ciao, ciao, ciao. America, America. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's America. That's a good, a good. Okay. Uh, well, you know, what do you want? And I, and, I, and I started to sound like somebody off of a, you know, a, a bad joke trying to place my order. And finally the guy says, alto, alto, alto. Yeah? Just talk English for God's sakes. <laughs> and he spoke better than I did. And <clears throat> it was, we made the order. We got more uh, marble than we ever imagined. I still have some of it. Uh, but we ordered directly from Italy. Uh, and I've gotten some from quarries in Serp Serpentine from Wyoming, uh, some from Oregon. And, yeah, and even when there was a talc mill in Marble Mount, uh, uh, I had picked up stones there from their parking lot. Hey. <laughs> Wherever works. <laughs> a, a long time ago. Yeah, that, they, they've torn it down. <laughs> but, but they used beautiful carving stone as dividers in their parking lot. <laughs> and I went in there one day and I saw the, most beautiful stuff. Come on, they're not going to miss this. 
well, they they didn't miss it because I'll just tell you they closed the plant, so that was okay. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from uh, Ray and Susan, and they say, "Hi, Tony. We have a piece by you, pen and ink etching, uh, black turnstones on rocky shore." Oh yeah. Could you could you say a word or two about that piece? Well, that uh, is is clear in my mind in terms of the episodes that I think many of us have walking along some of our shorelines in the winter when the turnstones come down here to winter, especially black turnstones. Uh, well, those are, you know, occasionally we get ruddy, I, I suppose, but uh, for all intents and purposes, when they're on the ground foraging out, you know, by the edge of the surf or by the water line uh, or up a little higher, you don't see them because their plumage matches so beautifully and you come up right up on them and then suddenly they burst into flight with these gorgeous patterns of black and white uh, in the wings and the tail. And uh, it uh, is a very hardy, and like so many of the subjects that uh, I tend to interpret, I see them much more closely when I'm working the form itself and I begin to appreciate the extraordinary evolution that a species goes through to open up a little niche for life mm -hmm. in a turnstone specialized beak. You know, they turn stones and they find the underside of the stone as a, as a source for food supply, while another species is over the top. Uh, you don't see an oyster catcher flipping stones. You know, they're coming in from the top with that big powerful bill and pulling something out of a barnacle. But, <clears throat> um, uh, that that's yeah that's one of my favorite birds along the shoreline is what i would say great thank you um a question you you have also done the ravens at sleeping lady in leavenworth also correct yes you saw a picture of that uh okay. with my with my daughter that's also the emissaries i did an edition of those uh they're all different a little bit uh the mount baker one was done for the mount baker ski and Duncan Howitt uh, and I worked on that uh, at the time. And they did a, a well, both uh, the conference center and, and, and Duncan at the, uh, Bob Baker Ski did a really wonderful job of presenting it, you know, getting it into position where you, where you can see it and you can get to it and reach it. And they placed it in a way that it is indeed an emissary. It's a welcoming form. Uh, and just again, like, I think the influence of the native people has been a powerful part of my artistic career. Uh, the welcoming entities uh, of their designs from totemic forms to, to other forms in, in the cedar work that was done. Uh, it's a, uh, a gesture in art that is, uh, well, it's throughout cultures, you know, to be sure. But I think the Northwest Coast uh, native people have, have had that influence on what I do. And it, it certainly made me aware. I wouldn't say that uh, I am seeking to imitate as much as I am uh, appreciating and expressing that appreciation for what they have done. And I'm inspired by it. Um, what about the, the piece near the Guimas Ferry landing on the Anacorda side? Did you do that piece? No, no, I don't think I did. I, you know, I, I don't think I did. I, uh, I don't think that's one of mine. Although, uh, I have been surprised sometimes when, uh, <clears throat> it, one of the things that surprises me is how long I've been doing this. Um, and it's, um, yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, it's been a lot of years and it's okay. I mean, I still have a few left, but, in, in any event, I don't forget them, but sometimes they go through a couple of hands and, and I may have done it for one place and somebody may have then either sold it or donated it and placed it somewhere else. Uh, by the way, I did want to mention my friend Ed Nordeen, mm -hmm. who's, who's up in that area. Uh, and and uh, Ed's work uh, with the beauty of, of Nat natural subjects is 
is singular. And and I I, I mentioned Leo and I mentioned Peregrine as those are those are three sculptor uh, folk. And but I could give you a list and I would say discover please how some of your our our artists here in the Northwest are really not only paying tribute but interpreting for us uh, this exceptional place that we live in and how important it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's you want to get well. It, it, I'll just say important. I say anything more, I'll get emotional. Well, I just got word from uh, some one of our our viewers that that piece by Aguinas is uh, a Le is a Leo Osborne piece. So there you go. Okay, there yeah. you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, good. I good. I mentioned Leo again. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Way to go, Leo. Yeah. We've uh, got a couple more here. If you're if you're up for it, I'm up for it. All right. So this one is kind of a comment that will lead into another person's question. I think this person says, "I loved the texture in the marble muralette piece you showed us." It occurred to me that I didn't know if the supporting stone was supposed to be the waves of the ocean, but the texture also looks so much like the texture of the layers of weathered rough bark. I love looking oh. at both textures at the same time, thinking about this hurt, how this bird experiences patterns in its life from the different habitats it moves through. Well, that, that's, that's great. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the virtues of art is that you have people who come to your work with their expectations, their, their values, their understanding, and their openness to discovery. And, and I don't want to impose mine as much as I just want to share them. And if they trigger a response that is different than maybe the one I set out uh, for, so much the better, really, as long as it doesn't uh, detract from a positive experience that, that I felt about the subject and turn it into something else. Uh, and the marble murelet uh, is on a water surface. Uh, Bird at Sea is what its title is. And my interest was to show, the, suggest the turbulence uh, uh, that that the tiny little species faces in its life and, and the persistence and perseverance and determination and the fact that it's still here, uh, making it all the more miraculous and beautiful to me. Uh, pushing into, the, into that sea, way out to sea, again, tiny bird. And then sometimes in the storm tossed waves in some of our inlets here in around Anacortes. And you, you, can't help but then catch, I guess, the, the, the turbulence beneath the subject. And you can make it anything you want, I suppose, as long as you have a feel, the spirited little form, testing it, uh, relying within it, uh, lining up with it, whatever it's doing, surviving. Uh, and it's one stone, you know, it's, it's a solid piece, part of it textured, part of it polished. And speaking of polish, we have a question. How, how do you polish your stone? You mentioned briefly a little sandpaper, but um, how, how does that work? <laughs> well, <laughs> a little sandpaper, yeah. I've probably gone through a ton of it over the years. <clears throat> well, again, the wet and dry paper on stone is pretty, when you're going to polish it, it, it's one thing to, to grind it down and to rasp it down. Uh, some rasps just the stone is too hard. You're going to use a diamond grinder to take it down to form. I used a diamond, not only a diamond saw, but a diamond grinder in the falcon with the wing out uh, to get up underneath and scoop out where the wing was catching the wind. Uh, <clears throat> but then you go back in after you've done the grinding. Then you can go back in with your Riffler files and fine uh, tune the lines and smooth them out. And then after that is where you get to the wet and dry. You go from grinder to file to the wet and dry paper with a grit maybe uh, 150 uh, and, and start with 150 in water flowing uh, as you're, because it'll sweep away the grit and you don't go over it and over it again. And then you go down to a 220 and then maybe uh, 
all the way down to a 600 uh, if you're really trying to polish something up, which I might if I wanted to polish the eye. But the rest of it, <clears throat> uh, I'm not trying to make a piece of jewelry. What I'm trying to do is emphasize the smoothness, the textures. So sometimes, like in those original uh, pieces that we saw, they were finished pretty rough. Uh, those were the ones that were done with a pool table slate because you know it was all texture there that I was emphasizing. And, and all I needed to do was get enough polish in it that it would pick up some color, but I did want some texture in it. And other, other times you want it smooth. But the, the polishing, as I said, is, is one of the great adventures. That's the return. You start to, whoa, where did that color come from? That's exactly, oh, oh my God, the gods are speaking to me. And sometimes I think they are, whoever they are out there, because stuff comes out of nowhere. And I say, holy goodness, uh, look, look at that. It, it's wonderful. And <laughs> so, so the poly audience is getting a chuckle over here. Uh, <laughs> so in any event, it, it's, uh, it's one of the great parts of the whole process is the polishing. Yeah. And then when you wax it, boom, you know, and it really finishes. How, uh, how long did it take you to finish the Raven's emissaries, a piece like that? How long is that? I did a little maquette which is a miniature in clay. Uh, uh, yeah, it was in clay. And then in wax, I finished that. And then uh, I had it cast. And the uh, guys at the foundry said, hey, you know, why don't we point this up and, and make a larger one? And I thought this was a great idea, but I didn't know where I would take the larger one. You know, you, sometimes you just, you know, you, you do it, because you want to do it, you have to do it. You, you call it on speculation that you might at some point have a place for it. And I've done a number of those. But in this case, uh, I would say between the maquette to, to finishing up that first emissaries, it probably took me two, two and a half years because I went from the small one and then we pointed it up and then there were delays. And then we got the waxes from uh, the, well, then we did the model, the, the full-scale model. Then we took the molds, and then we got the waxes. This is another thing we should do sometimes is a program on bronze casting because it is, it's a long, long, interesting process. But then you work the waxes, then the waxes go back to the foundry, then they invest them, burn them out, pour the bike, on and on and on, put it all Humpty Dumpty back together again. And then you do the installation which is in its own right an adventure. So uh, if you just took the sleeping lady uh, or you took the uh, uh, Mount Baker ski emissaries, it, it involved a lot of processes and a number of years, but you're doing other things at the same time. I mean, you're not just on that one and nothing else because the foundry's doing their job, you're doing your job and, and you're doing other work. Uh, smaller things so you know you keep the momentum going yeah. but but I, I mean I'm resisting myself here because I'm really getting a head of steam up uh, <laughs> the, I, I don't want to get into some of the installations because the, those are, are like the Keystone Cops you're too young to remember that but I used to watch these comedies where the uh, Cops would go out, all the cars would never get anywhere. They keep bumping into each other. Some of the installations have been like the Keystone Cops because somebody didn't, you know, do their job. And uh, but everything worked out. You know, you just stay the course. And uh, yeah, yeah. The the wisdom seekers that's in front of the library uh, in the municipal center in Redmond. You saw those, yeah, three on the top and one on the bottom because the one on the bottom is looking up at the three on the top because you not only learn uh, by going out into the world, but you learn from watching and learning from other adults. That was the concept I wanted to convey. But there was just one funny thing after another over that. And that, I think it took about a year and a half to get that one done. But. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because 
I'm thinking about all the stuff I'm not going into, but but that's okay. Another time. We're, we're we're trying to do these uh these talks quarterly, so we'll we'll get you back out. Yeah, <laughs> we can <laughs> we can go in as in depth as you want. <laughs> two more two more questions for you, and then we'll we'll let you go. Good. So. Is there a bird, mammal, or other creature that you have not yet rendered that you would like to explore, and in what medium? Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I, yes, uh, there are uh, some, uh, and I, and I guess they initially would be in in a uh, in a bronze because i just don't have any stone that immediately presents its own idea to me you know as to what it might be uh, and i as i said earlier i'm not going to out impose something on the stone but i think i would definitely w want to to do more of a expression of tribute to Something like a sea turtle, for instance. Uh, and I've done small pond turtles. And gosh, they're subtle and beautiful in their own right. I mean, ordinarily you don't immediately think of a turtle as being this classy, showy subject. But and there are all number, uh, any number of birds that uh, I've yet to, to interpret. But the other part of that question is, I'd like to go back to some that I've done before, because now I have uh, understood the subject over the years better. I know where uh, I can go, and I think I have the skills to get there. And I and I want to do them again uh, in a in an attitude that I think would be more fulfilling for me and for them. So. And I would include even a raven, of which I probably done more of any subject that I have. They're endless. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm not so much somebody who wanted to interpret the, you know, the flash and the color and the patterning, although I think that's important as much as I am the form, uh, the emotion, uh, the attitude, uh, and actually the, the similarities that we share with, with other life. Uh, I mean, the, I can see a, a hawk strike some of the same, a young hawk, same attitudes of tentativeness and, and yet determination to get into the world I've seen a little kid, you know, uh, you know, re, shall I or shall I, I'm going to, I got to, you know, and those are the kinds of common ground experiences that I'm thrilled with. And I, you know, I would like to do more of that. I, I got around answering the question, I think, but that's what's on my mind. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Last question. We, we saved maybe the most important question of the evening for the last one here. And that is, how many bird calls do you know? And I would add, how many can you do? <laughs> I used to be able to do a lot more than I can now before my lips ran out of elasticity. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can remember as a kid, Putting, you know, you know, when you put your hands up like that and boop, 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 doing a screech owl by blowing. I, I don't do that anymore. I, maybe you still can at, at my age. But in any event, uh, my mother was a consummate whistler. And she was in vaudeville in the Zigfield Follies in Chicago as I think, what, a 14, 15 year old who'd gone down there with her older sister and performed in a bird cage in Chicago. Uh, you're only a bird in a gilded cage thing. I mean, I mean, this is all true. And my mom could whistle and do bird calls like nobody else. And she would, when I was growing up as a kid, whistle me down from three blocks away to get me home. They didn't have to yell. <laughs> she would whistle. She was that loud as well as good. So I did carry over some of that. I'd say I could probably do a half a dozen uh, calls with with some authenticity particularly <laughs> crows and ravens which you know squawk and or growl <laughs> uh, but a few hawks 
I used to do a good kestrel uh, and a red tail and uh, red shouldered hawks, uh, the high pitch scream type thing, you know. And but it's a it, it, it's a it's it's a skill that I have a lot of respect for, uh, and I and I know some in my mind that I don't do, but I didn't answer your question uh, because I wish I I knew more. Uh, but the owl calls have always been something I'm fond of. Yeah. Oh, you definitely answered the question. That was great. <laughs> well, you want to? I'll give you my barred owl. Yeah, let's hear a barred owl. The barred owl, uh, which we had at the house for a number of years, an injured one, would out of nowhere, uh, in, in the middle of the day, I think because it liked to startle, produce the most blood curling, curdling. <laughs> and we did that one time, and I swear a neighbor came off the ground about six inches. Now, she, she didn't even know the owl was there. You know, owls are pretty subtle. And he was up in his little roost in a cage where it was protected, didn't fly because of the wing damage. But boy, could he call. And we can hear the barred owls in our woods. In, in Anacortes, up above Mount Airy and around Airy, Mount Airy. And gosh, we get out into the woods and by God, you know, having the woods as you do in that area with all the services that they provide, you know, providing the air we breathe, the diversity of life that surrounds us, uh, the cleaning and cleansing of the water, the empowerment of the water, the protection of the substrate, all of this incredible service that we get from basically nothing other than stewarding them, you know? And so your organization is so important, so important. Thank you, we, pre we really appreciate that. And, you know, we, uh, we couldn't be who we are without all of our supporters and all the folks that are on this webcast and supporting us this week. So, you know, and, and thank you for your time, Tony. I've got, um, it's not a question, but um, it's a, a comment that I think sums up pretty much how I felt about this and how I'm sure a lot of people felt. Uh, no question, just appreciation. This has been great. I laughed out loud, shattered a curse with joy, and even got a few tears feeling the passion. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, okay, uh, well, good night. Good yeah. night, my friend, and, and hopefully we'll get to talk to you again soon. Look forward to it, Asa. Thank you. Thank you so bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you to everybody out there for joining us. Remember, this is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Please, if you've got the time, if you haven't already, head on over to our fundraising page, Friends of the Forest, with a dash in between each word, dot causevox, C-A-U-S-E-V-O-X, dot com. And we've got two more nights, our big event Friday live stream and auction. Um, and we're going to be talking a lot about what we're doing as an organization to help out the community, help out the forest lands on Friday. So thank you so much for being here and we'll see you soon.